Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High, a local artist finds inspiration in his surroundings. So we're on the east of Newark. You just kind of can look over the fields that are in the distance and just kind of exhale. And they say to be president, you're gonna need a big head. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan. Welcome to Broaden High. Columbus artist Todd Camp was seven years old when his mother found him painting a scenery backdrop on his bedroom sheet, and rather than scolding him, offered him encouragement. That, he says, is when art found him, and he knew that's what he'd do for the rest of his life. The Mansfield native, who currently works as an administrator for the Columbus Cultural Arts Center, finds refuge at his farm in Newark and says his abstract paintings are largely influenced by his surroundings. I don't like to give away the secret right away. I like it to be this sort of mysterious, you know, how did you do that? Abstract art is a tough thing. People think, oh, I can do that. And I, how many thousand times I've heard people say, oh, my kid can do that. But it takes a lot of imagination. I think more so imagination than kind of copying what's right in front of you. I think that's the biggest part about abstract art is you have to identify with it somehow. Realistic work is easy because you know what it is. You, you look at it and say, oh, that's a portrait, and that looks exactly like this person. But to then abstract an idea takes a little bit more work, and it takes a little bit more work for the viewer. With abstract painting, you discover all these little things each time. It doesn't ever become a formula. It's a, tough, it's a tough sell, though, a lot of times, because people want to know what things are. So we're on the east of Newark. Uh, it's a beautiful farm land out here. There's a wonderful country, and it's nice and quiet. And after working in Columbus all day, it's kind of a nice retreat to, to come out here and, and, uh, and just kind of relax a little bit and unwind. You don't have to worry about all the traffic and all the things that, that happen in Columbus. We have eight and a half acres here. We have a barn, uh, my studio here. A lot of times I long for being in the city, but the trade-off is kind of this uh, serene landscape that's out here. There's not a flat spot here anywhere. And the top of the hill is another just magical place. I think it's the quietest place that's here on this property. And when you get up there, you just kind of exhale a little bit. When I first, we first moved out here, uh, a lot of my work was about trees and some of the um, nature that's out here. I incorporated those into paintings. I think, especially with abstract work, you have to work at it to get the answer that you're looking for. Our brains want that to happen. They want to, it wants to figure out what it is that's in front of it. For whatever reason, I've, I've never been traditional about anything, uh, so I feel that the materials that I use in my art kind of follow that same path. And by that I mean um, I use spray paint, I use um, acrylic paint, I use house paint, I use um, varnishes and shellacs and probably things that the masters would just absolutely go crazy about because they're like, they're going to say, you know, this stuff is never going to last. Well, the surface itself, I, I've gone to now wood panels versus canvas because of the nature of applying the paint is very physical in terms of using a squeegee and pressing and, and, and trying to draw the paint. 
the manner in which I put it on the actual surfaces. Uh, I don't use brush as much, I use squeegees, and that doesn't work so well on a canvas because it dents it in. Uh, so the wooden panels have been sort of the answer to that. But the one thing that I like to put in to all of the uh, particular work like that is um, pattern paper, uh, that uh, clothing patterns. I like to put that in there because it is, there's a lot of marks and, and kind of uh, these ghost kind of images that happen when you put a paint over top of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's for me directions and, and this kind of um, lines that create roads. A lot of what I was doing earlier with these was, was about traveling back and forth. Uh, so it was traveling back and forth to Columbus. These are the things that I would abstract out of 161, for instance, because it was such a long stretch of just nothing. But the lines on the road became sort of the lines in the painting. It's interesting because, like I said, with those, I was looking down at the road and into the fields. And with the work I'm doing now with the cloudscapes, it's looking up. Works by Todd Camp are currently on view at the Mansfield Art Center. Dreamers and Myth Makers, A Pathway to the Sky, is open through March 8th. Learn more online at mansfieldartcenter.org. The artists in this next segment have also been influenced by their environment. This time, it's the strip mines in the rural Midwest. Ann Holman and Jen Townsend are metalsmiths who recently opened a storefront in Grandview that provides retail space for more than 50 local artists. The two are on a mission to incite passion for handcrafted jewelry while sharing their knowledge and talent through workshops. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and shortly after I was born, my dad's job brought us to northern Minnesota. He worked in the steel industry, and we lived in the middle of all the iron ore mines. I think there was something instinctual that came up later in my life about like working with metal and, and the ethical parts of working in metal. Since then, I've decided to work exclusively with recycled precious metals. The smithery came to be out of a need to have everything in one place. Anne and I both had the same dream to have a spot where we could sell our work, we could sell other people's work while having a community aspect to it, which is why we wanted to have the workshops here. As soon as we realized that, we just both kind of had a turning point where we're like, let's just make this happen. We're going to set this um, enamel cabochon that I made into this sterling silver setting. I'm going to use a bezel rocker to push the metal over the sides. And I've oxidized the silver to give it a dark look, so I'm just going to um, give it kind of a brushed texture. And then there it is. I am going to solder posts onto the backs of all these. These are all going to be earrings. And I'm melting a little ball of solder over here. I'm getting it to stick to the end of my ear post. And then I'm going to heat up my silver piece over here, the little earring. And I want it to get to the right temperature before it melts, but hot enough that the solder is going to melt. And I just want to see the solder melt right around the bottom edge of that ear post. And then they have little tiny pieces of flower petals, like cut into little microscopic pieces and set inside there. And these can be custom made to commemorate any occasion where you might have flowers, like a wedding, a funeral, a graduation. There's something about the story of jewelry and that it is an expression of who you are as a person.
the Smithery on Grandview Avenue offers all kind of jewelry making workshops. From enamel earrings to copper cuff bracelets, there are options for all ages. Check them out online at shopthesmithery.com. In celebration of President's Day, we're sharing this segment from our friends at PBS in Houston. To be president, they say you need a big head. Inspired after a visit to Mount Rushmore, Houston artist David Attucks decided the only way to appreciate the details of the facial features of those monumental carvings up close was to create his own. He sculpted 43 enormous busts, one of each American president, and they are all on view outside his studio in Texas. Take a look. Bill Clinton, that's Andrew Jackson. He had all that lovely hair. You can't tell whose body that is, they all look alike. Lincoln, Obama's body is somewhere around here. There's Van Buren, there's Taft, He's, can't miss him. My name is David Attucks. I'm a sculptor and a painter. That's Calvin Coolidge, who was president when I was born. And there aren't many people that can say that now. There's Hoover, who was president when I grew up. So I went to Canada to visit friends, and on the way back I drove through Mount Rushmore and saw that for the first time and was really overwhelmed by the majesty of it, the size of it. But the problem was I couldn't get close to it. You have to look at them through binoculars, you know, they're far away, to see that expression in their eyes. And I missed that part. So when I was driving back to Texas, the idea popped into my small brain. Wouldn't it be a great idea to do the presents big, but not that big? So I thought, I can't do just the four, I'll do all of them. So there were 42 at the time. And that's how this came to be. One of these would be Jefferson, the other would be uh, Washington, because that was the style. All those bearded guys were from Ohio, and it was kind of one after the other, and they all looked alike. And I have a hard time remembering myself. This, I remember, is Teddy Roosevelt by the tie. He liked that design, but his head is around the corner. Start with a life-size model in clay, and draw a line parallel to the floor every half inch. And then you, with a little contour device, you get those shapes. Then when you have all those, you convert that to acetate or film, put them on an overhead projector and project those on styrofoam. And the styrofoam is then cut out and stacked up. And the analogy is kind of like if you took a, a green pepper and cut it up for a salad and enlarged every piece times 10, put it back together, you'd have that exact shape times 10. So you finish it off in plaster and clay and then make a giant rubber mold of the whole head. Concrete is washed into those five layers with various reinforcement in the concrete, uh, fiberglass mesh and steel mesh. Then those two halves are put together and one of my guys crawls inside and welds them together and then that makes the head. All the heads are not the same size. Eight of them are 20% bigger than the rest because uh, Arthur Schlesinger years ago decided to try to get all the presidents evaluated in the opinion of the heads of history departments and major universities around the country. So when that consensus came in, there were eight of them that were called the great presidents. So I decided to make them bigger. My favorite would be Lincoln. Uh, because he was easy to do. There were so many great photographs of him, and it, his features are, you can't confuse him with anybody else. The hardest to do, sort of, was Ford, because he doesn't have features that jump out at you. The Beatles, why are they here? Uh, they're here quite coincidentally. They have nothing to do with the president's head. Well, I wanted to do standing figures that have no arms, but their instruments are part of the composition. I love the Beatles, everybody does, so the Beatles were a natural choice. Look at Ringo's gonna play drums on Roosevelt's head, now that's not right either. Big uh, monumental pieces, they have to be at a place where they can be seen. Here's Teddy Roosevelt, uh, there's George W, and here's LBJ, and that's Chester Arthur with all that sideburn stuff. It's a crazy idea, but I'm, I have crazy ideas. Here's Jefferson, and there's Nixon, Madison, James Madison, Harry Truman. It's a 
a curse. <laughs> Celebrate President's Day on February 16th with a visit to the Campus Martius Museum in Marietta and find out why Ohio earned the nickname, the Mother of Presidents. Learn more at campusmartiusmuseum.org. And here's another story out of Texas. Venezuelan artist Jesus Rafael Soto died in 2005 at the age of 81, but not before designing an immersive kinetic environment that took nearly a decade more to produce by a team of artisans dedicated to bringing his monumental work to life. Soto made 25 of his so-called series of penetrables, immersive sculptures consisting of dangling tubes with which viewers can interact. The Houston penetrable is the only one he designed as a semi-permanent piece, and one of the few he created as an indoor piece. It was the artist's final and most ambitious work, and it was on display last summer at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Jesus Rafael Soto is one of the most remarkable artists of the 20th century. Born in Venezuela, the second half of his career took place in, in France, mainly in Paris. And he was one of an important generation who explored ideas of space, movement, kinetic art. Uh, essentially a formalist, thinking about color and shape and the realization of form using what he knew about human perception in order to realize spectacular works of art like the one behind me here. It was commissioned in 2004 and many Houstonians will remember that we had a similar but much smaller work on loan from a private collection out on Bissonnette and uh, it was magical to see the interaction of the public with that work and that gave birth to this much larger piece. Unfortunately, the artist died the following year, but his studio and his assistants continued the engineering necessary to make this work. It's 24,000 PVC strands, all of them hand-painted with yellow in order to realize that perfect ellipse in the center eight tons of steel above or below the ceiling, and then of course all the lighting. It was all last summer that seven people worked to thread each of those strands into the superstructure, the armature, and then it took uh, another four weeks this spring in order to mount it here in Cullinan Hall. But it's spectacular. It's been, without question, our most popular work of art and enjoyed by the, our visiting public. I don't think any two experiences are alike. Uh, people bring so much of their own history and memory and experiences. One child came through and said car wash. Uh, other people think of science fiction and space travel. The beauty of the work is that the imagination is set free and you can experience it either as capturing space because it is the realization of space and we become so aware of that cube within that extraordinary fan-shaped volume that Mies van der Rohe created. The perception of that ellipse which is constantly changing. To me, I, I like it most from outside and from this balcony so I can watch individuals inside enjoying it and then watching the color dance as the yellow orb reflects light. Um, but wading through it is a lot of fun too and taking a selfie inside and then uploading it to your Pinterest or Instagram account and enjoying the printout that we provide here from the printer uh, is a great souvenir to have from the museum. We'll take it down this autumn and then we'll put it back up from time to time every two or three years as time allows and the space allows but already a number of my colleagues at other museums have asked uh, to borrow it. So I have a feeling uh, this work has legs and we'll be seeing it probably around the world in the years to come. Our final story today comes from Milwaukee. Photographer Tom Furtiber studied under the renowned landscape photographer Ansel Adams in 1958 and still remembers the lessons he learned back then. He's known in his community for his award-winning advertising photography, but he has spent the last 40 years focusing his lens on the landscape. His love of the landmarks of Route 66 and the scenery of the American West is what really showcases his passion for photography. I, I enjoy shooting the west, I enjoy shooting mountains, scenery. I also enjoy 
Uh, like Route 66, the memory of it, the, the old dilapidated homes, beat up cars, it just, I don't know why, but it's in my DNA to like that subject matter. My name is Tom Furterbar, and I'm a retired advertising and fine art photographer. I wanted to be a photographer from the age of 12 when my sister gave me a box camera. I really found it a nice way to uh, express my emotions. I'm better, I think, at doing it visually than in words. It's a strange thing. Uh, all I knew is I wanted to be a photographer. When I finished uh, high school, I applied at the Milwaukee Journal to be a photographer. And of course, uh, with a high school education, they wouldn't accept me, but they gave me a job as a copy boy, which was an editorial assistant, $18 a week. <laughs> I worked there about a year and a half, but they kept telling me, Tom, you gotta go to college if you wanna be a photographer here. So I went to University of Wisconsin, graduated from there, and uh, moved on to, uh, to, to spend one year at the Leighton School of Art. My personal photography is, right now, it's devoted to shooting the Tetons National Park and Route 66. It's difficult to shoot the old road. It's pretty hard to make a good picture of the, of the old road. But I, liked, I enjoy shooting the older buildings as they're dilapidating. And in a way, there'll always be the ability to shoot Route 66 because the buildings along the way, some of them are decaying more and more and more. And some of the newer ones today will be decaying in 10 or 12 years. So there's always a new supply of old buildings and old cars and so on to photograph, so it isn't like you've exactly run out of subjects. My plan normally is to say shoot one state, okay, let's say I'm going to go out this trip for 10 or 12 days and I'll shoot New Mexico. So I'll drive to the edge of New Mexico and then start shooting. Uh, might take me three or four or five days to cross New Mexico, then I'll come back because coming back you see different things, the lighting is different, you see subjects from a different angle, so I'll shoot New Mexico coming back too. And then if I see something in some of the other states, Missouri or Kansas or Illinois, I'll shoot them too, but basically I'll go out and shoot one state. I like black and white for some fine art subjects. For Route 66, I think I like the color better. Ansel Adams is probably my, uh, my primary uh, mentor. I learned about him, oh, I guess that would be shortly after I finished college in the 50s. And uh, was lucky enough to get an invitation to uh, one of his seminars. It was his third seminar and he only accepted 20 students. And the seminar was 10 days long, but it was a tremendous experience working with him. It was just a marvelous experience. And uh, that's one I'll never forget. We were out there one day uh, near Mariposa, California, photographing some barns. And then I saw near the bottom of the barn, a cluster of uh, barley growing up in front of the weathered wood of the barn. And I said, God, that'd be a beautiful shot. But boy, it's gonna look just like Ansel Adams shot it, you know, and he's here. And if I set up my camera, he's gonna say, can't you do anything original, you know? So I set it up to make a horizontal cropping, which I knew was wrong because it should be vertical. Everything was going that way and you shouldn't try to make something vertical into a horizontal. But anyways, I set it up. Okay, Ansel came by a little while later and he bent down under the focusing cloth, which is that black cloth that covers the camera. And he looked into the camera for a while and he took the cloth off and he looked at me and he said, Tom, don't you think that should be a vertical? So that really made me happy because that's what I wanted, so of course I took the back of the camera, turned it, made my vertical shot, and uh, that's one of the shots that I'm most proud of from that series. His philosophy was a camera is designed and the lens is designed to make things sharp and to show detail. That's kind of what I took away from him. Pictures should be sharp from, black, from the foreground to the distance, if you can, and you should have a full range of values from solid black to pure white. There's such a great variety there at Yosemite. Tremendous just variety of uh, subjects to shoot. When I make a photograph, my goal is to have the, the viewer experience the same emotion when, when they look at the photograph that I did when I saw the subject. I'm hoping that I can transmit my feelings, my emotions, in terms of the print 
so that the person can get the same response that I did. ColumbusArts.com is Central Ohio's most comprehensive source for arts and cultural events. Be sure to check it out to find great things happening around town this week. So I followed your footsteps in the snow, oh, and they led me to your door. Let me feel some warmth and I remembered what my thawing heart is for. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. And be sure to download the WOSU Public Media mobile app, where you can watch full episodes on your smartphone or tablet. This week, we're leaving you with the sounds of Dave Buecher in The Historians and a track off their 2013 LP, What Can Bring You Back to Me. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. There must be something about the weather as it's changing All these molecules of air trying to keep us separated I know change is what we need desperately I'm just sorry that I ever had to leave Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.